Welcome to High Impact Growth, a podcast from Demagi about the role of technology in creating a world where everyone has access to the services they need to thrive. I'm Amy Vaccaro, Senior Director of Marketing at Demagi and your co-host, along with Jonathan Jackson, Demagi's CEO and co-founder. Today, we have the final installment in our mini-series of episodes from conversations recorded on the sidelines at the Global Digital Health Forum this past December in Arlington, Virginia. Today, we have two conversations with global health and development leaders focused on innovation in digital health. You'll hear from Olukunli Akanusi, who's the Technical Officer for Digital Access at FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. Olukunli has a strong background in public health, and at FIND, he designs interventions in the area of digital health and deploys them in low- and middle-income countries to ensure that they improve equitable access to diagnostic technology. You'll also hear from Erica Troncoso, who sits on the innovations team at Japigo and leads the Frontier Technology Solutions Portfolio in collaboration with their digital health and data and analytics team. She's looking closely at how tech can enable primary health care. We'll hear a bit about the important work each of them is doing, and in particular, how they're thinking about creating better jobs for frontline health workers when designing digital health innovations. When Demagi set its five-year strategy last year, the first pillar in that strategy is to improve frontline worker jobs to improve outcomes. And one of the ways that we do this is through our design under the mango tree approach of working directly with users to design and iterate on applications. Both Olukunle and Erica speak to a similar approach in their work. First, we'll hear from Olukunle in conversation with Jonathan on his focus on digital diagnostics. What came into digital diagnostics? I actually found out that there's been a lot of focus around actually ensuring people start and go through the cascade of care and complete the care. But however, when I started working in the HIV space, I remember the unit uh, 1980, where it's critical to even identify and diagnose people before they can even then start the necessary care. And there was no way to achieve the goal of ensuring more people get care and get treated without being diagnosed at first. So I saw that diagnosis was very pivotal into improving access to care and of course, curbing disease prevalence as well. So um, what can we find this actually has spurred that opportunity to ensure that no one is left behind. People are tested and in a timely manner diagnosed and of course linked to treatment, which is one of the core components of our strategy, digital health strategy, that's fine. One of the areas that is of critical importance and a lot of the value we need to create you know, there's not enough money to go around. There's not enough donor funding is how to improve the effectiveness of these cascades of care and understanding the population segmentation of who needs to be receiving that care is such a critical aspect of this. And knowing how and where to invest across that cascade of care is also critical. And so I think diagnostics play an exceptional role, not just top of the funnel of getting patients to know their status and getting to the system, but also for some diseases. Repeated diagnostics so you know, are you sufficiently virally suppressed? Are you able to ensure that you're decreasing the burden in any population? So as you think strategically, how do you think about which diseases to target with diagnostics and where the biggest diagnostic gaps are at the various levels of care? So I must say, when I joined FIND, I joined during the COVID period. And as you may be aware, FIND's mandate is more around the diagnostics of Sheila. And basically, we all know the importance of diagnostics in, in actually curbing the spread of COVID-19. One thing that we did was to actually leverage our experience and lessons from setting up systems, surveillance systems. And we used that to then inform and to work with ministries of health to actually get them to understand where they should target COVID response. We've done so in some of our work with countries in Africa, where we worked with the countries to actually 
set up systems. And as a matter of fact, the Magic played a very good role uh, in this collaboration. Like the, the work we did uh, with Rwanda, where we leveraged the RDT toolkit, worked with the MOH to be able to adapt that and then use that for decentralized, improved decentralized testing. That is the use of RDTs, the antigen RDTs for COVID-19 testing. And of course, that gave insight into where these tests need to be deployed and then helping to then maximize this scarce resource in terms of diagnostic technologies available for COVID. So that is how we have actually used, so it's sort of a cycle. We've used data to inform what we need to design and deploy. And we've used the insights gotten from those deployments to then inform response and the cycle continues. Thinking through better jobs, better outcomes. There's this balance of making sure we can collect the data that can be useful for program managers, epidemiologists, and surveillance people, while still making sure we're creating an empowering experience for the end user that's leading to a better job. And we from a lot of time trying to make sure the technology we were creating was usable and adaptable. But, you know, something we think a lot about to make sure, yes, we digitize the support these workers. Is it really creating a better job or is it giving us the data we want actually making the job worse for the frontline worker? How do you think about that challenge? So I find when we want to implement digital health projects. We ride on the principles of digital development. And part of it is to engage the users, to build with the users. So in coming up or conceptualizing with solution, we ensure that we engage, we understand the need, and we use that to inform the solutions we're going to design. And then we identified partners as well, locally, globally, with the experience to actually transcribe or translate that particular knowledge we've gotten from engaging the users into technical requirements that are used to carry out this design. So what then happens is that in the course of designing and bringing up these requirements and then developing the system, there is that continuous engagement of stakeholders in country. Stakeholders includes the health workers, the frontline health workers, the decision makers. We continue to engage them so that the end product is then targeted and designed to work with the workflow. It can function very well in the context for which it is designed to work. So that is how we ride on the principles of digital development to come up with digital solutions that we roll out. Next, let's hear from Erica Troncoso, who leads the Frontier Technology Solutions team at Japigo. First, we asked her about how she's thinking about creating better jobs for frontline health workers to create better outcomes. And how does she find the balance between introducing shiny new technology and ensuring that those new things are actually helping providers provide better care? So as you probably know, Chapago does a lot of healthcare worker trainings, and that's kind of our bread and butter is like upskilling these healthcare workers, and improving quality of care by working with health workers at the facility level directly. So yeah, this is something that's been on our radar for a while. And the digital solutions that we kind of have used to improve quality of care are usually like clinical decision support tools. So it, it really comes down to digital literacy with those. And if the healthcare worker has the digital skills to even use it, that could be an improvement to the job and be seen as like a positive and even continue their interest in staying in the profession. But if it doesn't, it could have the exact opposite effect. So yeah, just thinking about appropriate implementation of those, which does include a lot of like training and making sure, you know, we're not overburdening the health worker who is already so overburdened already. As somebody working in that innovation space, I think often, and this is certainly true of the field 10 years ago, we're drawn to hypothetical upsides. You know, we look at all these things, we're like, oh, but what if only? And often the what if only doesn't come to pass. You know, we only get 50% of the way there, which may be good enough, but it may not. Because we do see a lot in our industry over the years of like, that are constantly just tweaking and iterating. And it's hard, I think, for a lot of organizations or a lot of projects or strategies to, to kind of look at something like, actually, you know what, that's just not worth it anymore. And we should, we should switch. 
How do you think about when they kind of say, okay, this innovation just isn't having the value we hoped or thought it could, we should move on to the next idea? Yeah, this is definitely something that has over, always a challenge. I think one of the ways that we've try at least to go around this or, you know, is to involve the user in the design process. And that way it's things that are, con should be considered upfront are, and then you can also do rounds of iteration that, you know, that have buy-in from the user. So it's not like you're coming, oh, here's the product, test it out. It's like, okay, you, you've already helped us design this. Let's test it together and in real life and, and creating that buy-in, especially with health workers is like, truly valuable, I think. But it's really hard to do. I mean, like it's easier just to build something and say, hey, what do you think? <laughs> As opposed to like teaching people how to walk through that digital design process. Is there anything that kind of concerns you or you see as a gap and, you know, what's available, what you, you wish you were focusing on in terms of, you know, that whole patient life cycle we were talking about in the provider, but where you wish you were seeing more innovation or what areas are of concern to you that you're like, ah, you know, I, I wish there were more happening in this particular part of the ecosystem. I do wor I worry a bit about health worker digital literacy. And to be honest, a lot of the infrastructure um, in more remote settings and just that, you know, the last mile, I think about that quite a lot in terms of, you know, we have all these exciting projects, um, but I you know, are we leaving anyone behind? Are there gaps in data that we're not seeing? Uh, are there people that we are not reaching with, you know, even like through telemedicine, of course, they'd have to have a, you know, a device on their end as well. And so just thinking about how we can, you know, continue to broaden our interventions to make sure that we include those people. So yeah, it, I, that's not a specific technology or, or answer, but just kind of like thinking about ways to expand the population that we're, we're bringing the digital side to. Reducing health inequities is like one of the four pillars of our high-impact growth approach. And it's really hard to balance that because if you are designing the technologies to make sure they can reach everyone, there's, there's a lot of trade-offs you have to make versus only worrying about the top 10 or 20% of you know, the population. I'll add a few links in the show notes to a previous podcast episode where we talk more explicitly about designing under the mango tree and taking a product approach as we designed ComCare. You'll also get links to Demagi's high impact growth framework that Jonathan just mentioned, as well as additional links on designing under the mango tree and Demagi's five year strategy. And now back to eloquently for a few final words of advice for you listeners who may be embarking on projects within digital diagnostics or digital in general. I think one cannot overemphasize the need to engage the countries in which these interventions or the solutions are going to be de designed. We cannot overemphasize the need to actually engage them. I think that's the first bit. Then the second bit is we should, wherever is looking to come up with solutions that will work, it's important that the workflow of the context in which the solution will be used is taken into consideration because if a solution is designed or developed and it does not align with the workflow where it's going to, of where it's going to be deployed, then the adoption is unlikely. Then the third bit, first consulting, uh, consulting the stakeholder, second bit is actually de uh, designing with alongside workflow. And the third bit is the buy-in. It's important to secure the buy-in of the end users. If, the, if that is not secured, the product will be developed and it will not be used. And then the purpose is then defeated and we're back to square one. So I think those, that's not exhaustive, but I think those three are very pivotal to the success of digital health interventions. Thank you so much to Ola Kunle and Erica for joining us on this episode today. I'll share my quick takeaways from these two conversations. One, as we are designing digital health interventions, we need to be thoughtful about who we are leaving behind, even though this creates many trade-offs, and specifically considering the digital literacy of healthcare workers, including ensuring that we're offering appropriate training. Two, build digital health technology with your users. We heard this from both speakers. This can be a challenge, but it's also an imperative to create buy-in. 
and ensure that you're considering the existing workflow that the frontline health worker has and how your new intervention will fit within that. Third, beyond the user, continuous engagement with local country-based stakeholders as you're designing the intervention is also essential to ensure buy-in long-term. That's our show. Thanks so much for listening. Please like, rate, review, subscribe, and share this episode if you found it useful. It really helps us grow our impact. And feel free to write to us at podcast at demangi.com with any ideas, comments, or feedback. This show is executive produced by myself. Danielle Van Wick is our producer. Brianna DeRoos is our editor. And cover art is by Sudan Shikanth. Thank you.